request you all to go on mute and turn off your camera. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Vinusha Kannan from the Department of Psychology at National School of Journalism, Bangalore. And I welcome you all to this virtual talk at NSOJ. NSOJ regularly invites thought leaders for insightful and interactive talks on the pressing issues of our times. With the current lockdown situation in several parts of the world, we are finding new ways to continue hosting these talks. Today, we are delighted to host Professor Nick Coldry of the London School of Economics for a talk titled, Remembering Journalism's Public Rationale, Media and Public Policy Responses to COVID. The session will comprise of a 35 minute lecture presentation by Professor Coldry, followed by a Q&A, which will be moderated by Mr. Timothy Franklin, the founder of NSOJ. Before we get started, I request you to please follow a few guidelines in order to have a smooth and uninterrupted discussion. I request you all to kindly mute your channel and turn off your camera for an uninterrupted talk. The moderator or the speaker may specifically request you by name to articulate your questions. You may then unmute yourself and speak. We encourage you to ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag NSOJ Talks. Professor Coldry will try to answer as many questions as possible within the available time. I now ask Mr. Ashish Sen to unmute his mic. Ashish Sen is an independent communication consultant and serves on NSOJ's board of advisors. Ashish will introduce Professor Coldry. Thank you. Thank you, Vinusha. Good evening, friends. I'm delighted to be over here with you and particularly delighted to introduce Professor Nick Caldry and to say a few words about a man whose work and vision I deeply admire. Prof professor Nick Caldry is Professor of Media Communications and Social Theory at the London School of Economics and Political Science and faculty associate at Harvard's Berkman's Klein Center for Internet and Society. He is also one of the finest minds and scholars that I've had the privilege of meeting and interacting with. In fact, uh, I don't know whether Nick does, but I vividly remember our first meeting. It was at Our Media 2 in Barcelona in 2002, Nick. And after I heard your presentation, on media and exclusion and various other discussions which you led and for life and i am a fan for life of yours uh, and you know to describe professor coldry as a sociologist of media and culture is accurate but it hardly provides a glimpse of a man whose work and scholarship has contributed to and drawn from so many diverse disciplines, anthropology, discourse, discourse analysis, digitalization, geography, media studies, and of course, communication ethics and communication theory. This is a rare mind and man who is equally comfortable discussing community media and the place of media power in the digital age, as he is discussing linkages between voice, media and political economy and therefore enabling the likes of the works of economists like Amartya Sen on the one hand to rub shoulders with professors and gurus of communication like Raymond Williams on the other and all in the passage of one discussion. So friends I can promise you that this is going to be a riveting presentation. As an advocate of community communications, I've been particularly struck by Professor Colby's scholarship on voice and the distinctions that he makes between voice as process and voice as value. And as I say this, I'm in fact reminded of an extremely salient point 
which Nick brought up in an interview that he kindly gave to uh, Community Radio News, a quarterly journal, a, a journal which is brought out thrice a year by uh, the United Community Media, when he talked of the disconnect in democracies and closed regimes when voice as process is taken for granted. And I believe that this is something that is added significance given the times that we live in right now because it is no longer a question of just whose voice is heard in the media although that is very very important but it is a question of why media matters more than ever today along with well-known communication scholar clemencio rodriguez professor caldry has also led the chapter on media and communications in the 22 chapters 2018 report of the International Panel on Social Progress. He is the author of several books, and I'm not going to mention all of them over here, but just the latest, which is The Costs of Connection, which he co-authored with Professor Ulysses Meyers, and Media, Why It Matters. In fact, along with Professor Ulysses, Professor Caldry was scheduled to visit India and indeed Bangalore earlier this month on a countrywide tour facilitated by the UNESCO Chair on Community Media to discuss the implications of data colonization and data colonialism and his book, Costs of Connection. But unfortunately, the pandemic, COVID-19 and the lockdown has forced a postponement. For everyone's sake, and I do mean everyone, we hope that it will be in the near future that Professor Caldry's visit to India indeed becomes a reality. And we're all looking forward to that hugely, Nick. Meanwhile, over here, we're doing the next best thing possible. And thank you, Professor Caldry, for making this possible, for sharing your insights and wisdom on what is surely a very subject for all of us today. Remembering journalism's public rationale, media and public policy responses to COVID. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, Professor Nick Caldry. Thank you very much, Ashish. It's uh, lovely to see you again. And of course, I remember the first time we met and how we walked in uh, Barcelona talking for hours. And I really hope it won't be long before I'm back in India uh, meeting you all again in, in person. And I also want to thank Timothy Franklin and Venusha Kanan for, and colleagues for their excellent organization at the NSOJ of this event. It's a privilege to speak to you all. Um, I'm going to talk today in quite a general way because this is a huge topic relevant to all of us, but I hope what I say will be relevant to the particular situation both in India and in the other 17 countries uh, where some of you come from on this call. Um, and I'll be very much looking forward to your questions. What I want to do is to start out from some very general context um, about COVID-19. I'm not a scientist, I'm a citizen. So I'm affected like everyone else by this huge global crisis. And I need to know as a person more about what this crisis means. And some important journalism has helped me become aware of the bigger pattern that underlies the COVID-19 crisis. And here's an article that particularly struck me from John Vidal, one of the world's most famous environmental uh, correspondents writing for The Guardian just about a month ago, where he relates the crisis of COVID-19, which is affecting all of us so vividly at the moment, to a much bigger problem, which is that it's actually humanity's destruction of biodiversity that is creating the conditions for new viruses and diseases such as COVID-19. And he quotes a number of scientists in the article, including David Quammen from New York, who writes that we cut the trees, we kill the animals or cage them, send them to the markets, 
we disrupt ecosystems, we shake the viruses loose from their natural hosts. And when that happens, those viruses need a new host. And often we human beings are it. That's a striking and very sobering thought. And he goes on to quote another scientist who deals with the other side of this problem, which is the problem of how once the virus enters a human being, it then spreads between us because of our habits of travel. He quotes Bob Verve from California, who writes that we're in an era now of chronic emergency. Diseases are more likely to travel further and faster than before, which means that we must be faster in our responses. It needs investment, change in human behavior, and it means we must listen to people at community levels. We can't predict where the next pandemic will come from. The only certain thing is that the next one will certainly come. So the COVID-19 crisis, vast though it is, is just part of a much bigger possibility of long-term repeating crises linked to the global nature of the economy, the global nature of human interaction, travel, and so on. So how should we think as citizens all around the world about the challenge for humanity that this crisis raises? Well, there are actually many levels of crisis, as we all know. There is, of course, the global health crisis, or is it, as John Vidal suggests, an enfolding series of crises? Then there is the resulting global economic crisis caused by the consequences of government's public health policy reaction to the public health risk. But this global economic crisis is having very uneven effects on human beings resulting in a new social crisis as well an economic and a social crisis at the same time these crises are an opportunity for politicians of various sorts authoritarians who want to impose more and more surveillance on us as citizens through apps for contact tracing and other devices or politicians who want to impose their own sectional politics such as President Trump in the United States, as he did at the beginning, calling this the Chinese virus. At the same time, for those very same politicians, there's a new type of crisis, which is a reality crisis. Because they, even though they began by denying the truth of coronavirus, Bolsonaro, Trump, and others in other countries, they have had to face its reality. As Bill McKibben, the great environmental campaigner, put it, reality is capable of biting back and biting hard. So that's the multi-level crisis that we're all facing today. It's complicated. Surely, therefore, we must agree we need reliable public information to understand it, to even begin to confront it. So we go back to a cliche from 100 years ago from one of the first pieces of writing about the sociology of germ journalism from the American sociologist Robert Park, who wrote that reading, which was a luxury in the country, has become a necessity in the city. How much more it is a necessity today in an interconnected world? So that general point is obvious. We need information. We need good information. But that's very different from saying and explaining what is the rationale now for journalism as an institution. It's an especially tough question now at a time when older models of journalism are, as many of you know, already under threat. You're students of journalism, you're practitioners of journalism, but just, let me just for a moment run through what you know all too well about the nature of this threat to journalism that we so need today. There's an immediate threat to the economic models of journalism, which will produce the news that we need. There is, of course, the short-term collapse in demand for advertising all over the world caused by the global economic crisis that I just mentioned. But this comes on top of a much longer-term crisis, a long-term reduction in consumers' willingness to pay 
for news, to pay for newspapers, to pay to go behind the paywalls on news websites. And that economic issue, that reduction in willingness to pay for news, is linked to a much deeper undertrend, which is the weakening of advertisers' interest in cross-subsidizing specific media content in the way that they've done for a century or more. As a marketing executive interviewed by Joseph Thoreau a decade ago put it, marketers never wanted to underwrite the content industry, they were just forced because they had no other way of reaching their consumers. But now they do, of course. Now they're not interested in mass audiences so much. They're much more interested in targeting their ads at individuals who they can track very precisely because of the data they're capturing from them all the time as each of us moves around online. And that's making possible a totally new principle of advertising, very different from the mass advertising of the past, which is the principle of deep personalization, summed up in that phrase from an industry newsletter from seven years ago. How do you use only the things that are relevant to them and hide those that aren't? And how do you modulate that in real time? That's what advertisers want now, and it's a logic that is profoundly worrying for all commercially funded journalism everywhere in the world. So to sum up the problems which journalism faces everywhere today, there are three converging problems. The first is, and this in a sense is good, it's an opportunity, is what can journalism be now? There are so many diverse media through which journalism can be presented on. I'm going to focus on that third question. And there's a reason for that, which is that if we can't answer that third question as to why humanity, wherever it is, needs something like journalism for the future, for us to be safe, then no one will ever have an incentive to answer the first two questions. So let's focus on that third question. What are the dangers? What are the problems if looking ahead, societies no longer have an independent institution whose intrinsic purpose is to provide common flows of information, what we call journalism? And let's just think about the moment, how I've emphasized where I put the emphasis in that question. And sorry, by the way, if you can hear rain coming through, I hope you can't, but I'm, I'm talking from Britain where of course it's always raining and it is raining right now as I speak. So I hope it doesn't disturb your listening. But that's the question we want to focus on. And I'm emphasizing there the term society and the word independence. Why do I put that emphasis? Well, it's because, and this is maybe a frightening development, in the past month or two, some people are saying, that it's authoritarian states, such as China, that are much better placed than liberal democracies to address a major public health crisis like COVID-19. That was the argument of Korean philosopher, now living in Germany, Byung-Chul Han, a month ago in the Spanish newspaper El País. And this argument is based on saying that the whole infrastructure of democracies, including a free press, may not even be helpful anymore to address a massive public health crisis like this. What Han asked if the of authoritarian societies without any strong institutions of the free press, of course, is actually better, is actually more effective in addressing major public health crises. If that's right, then that surely has implications for how we think about societies in the future and how we think about the possible role of journalism within the future of societies. Every 19 crisis in view of the rest of the world. And of course, journalism is part of the reason for that. It's because a lot of the world does have free press and it's because governments, even if they're not democracies, care about their reputation, care about soft power in geopolitical battles that are to come, that we are seeing what is going on in other societies and comparing what's happening where we are with what's going on elsewhere. And those global comparisons change how we think about the arguments 
for journalism in the future, the public rationale for journalism. And I think that means that the core question to ask today is not what democracies need from information for journalists, from journalists, but what all human societies, wherever they are, whether or not their democracies need. The key question is not whether societies need some flow of information from somewhere. Of course they do. You can't fight a global pandemic without some accurate information. But the question is whether, and if so, why those information flows must be independent from the state, as journalism in the traditional model has been independent from the state. Those are the core questions, I think. But if they're the core questions, then maybe it's a problem, as Barbie Zellitzer pointed out a few years ago, that all our arguments for journalism that we've inherited from previous centuries are about democracy as the reference point. But there are many societies in the world that are not democracies, and they just as much need journalism today as those which are. So maybe, and I agree with Barbie Zellitzer here, maybe in thinking about why we need journalism, we have to start from somewhere else. And that's why in my attempt today for you to think again about why now in the COVID-19 crisis we need journalism. I don't want to start, start from the standard liberal theories of why democracy needs a free press. I want to start from somewhere else. I want to start from a theorist who I think is particularly appropriate as we think about the case of India, and Ashish already mentioned him in his introduction which is the thought of the great economist and philosopher Amartya Sen from India, but based for the past few decades in Harvard, United States. His back to the beginnings of economics and argues that economics was already always from the beginning, part of moral philosophy. It just forgot its origins two centuries ago, and now it needs to reconnect with them. And he develops a fascinating argument in many books, particularly the book Development is Freedom from 99, that human development actually isn't possible. It requires freedom. Freedom on two levels. Freedom involving fulfilling individual human needs, and freedom at a societal level involving the adequate flow of information through and across society back to government. Now, I know that the term development is controversial. I know in many ways it's a problematic term, and being a white Englishman, my forebears are part of the problems with the word development. It's because of the legacy of colonialism, especially British colonialism, that formed and shaped the path of so-called development in India and many other places. But Sen, coming from India, is a thinker who is contesting, who's trying to rethink development in new ways. So I just suggest it's still worth listening to him on this topic. And what does he have to say? Well, he argues there are, there are a number of levels on which freedom is important to development. First of all, starting with personal freedoms, the freedoms of you or I as an individual. Our freedom, the freedom of each of us to speak, to be heard, has, he puts it, an instrumental role in enhancing the hearing that people get in expressing and supporting their claims to political attention, including the claims of economic needs. So, as we know in India, when the lockdown was proposed, many pointed out that migrant workers were going to be massively disadvantaged by those general rules. Their economic needs urgently needed to be heard by the government. And of course, journalism and those people's own freedom of speech was crucial in making that possible. And that brings a second point, that the Sen points out it's not just about you or me speaking, but it's about how society as a whole starts to rethink, to reconceptualize what are economic needs. Who needs what? Who's likely to need what? That's only possible if people can speak freely. Because, as he says, people do not typically get what they do not demand. In other words, society needs 
to hear what people say, to hear what they think in relation to their understanding of what people in general need if they are to live adequate lives. That's just the personal level where freedom makes a difference to development. But there's also the level of institutions, including the free press. And here, Sen's famous example is the question of famines. He writes in his book that the process of preventing famines and other crises, and he includes here epidemics such as COVID-19, this process of preventing these terrible things is significantly helped by the use of freedoms such as the opportunity for open discussion, public scrutiny, elections, and uncensored media. And his classic example of a case where the absence of institutional freedom made famine happen was China. China's massive and devastating famines between 1958 and 1961, where Sen argues it was the lack of a free system of news distribution that misled the government itself, which was fed by its own propaganda and by rosy reports of local party officials. Sen even quotes Chairman Mao, who actually defended the importance of democracy for government in China and said that without democracy, you, the government, have no understanding of what is happening down below. It will be impossible to achieve unity of understanding and unity of action. Now, the case of China today in relation to democracy, in relation to digital and social media platforms, in relation to the role of government in surveilling those platforms is obviously very ambiguous, very ambivalent, as is the case of many other countries, such as the United States. But I think what Sen's approach brings out is that if we broaden our frame to development, human development as a whole, we get a much clearer idea as to why freedom and journalism in particular is absolutely essential to human life. That enables us then to reinterpret the old theories we've learned from the past about why we need a free press, why we need journalism in terms of this wider value of development. In terms, for example, of the idea that humanity needs knowledge to spread. As Thomas Paine puts it over 200 years ago, we need a representative system with a free press to diffuse knowledge throughout the nation on what has to be governed, to explode ignorance and so on. Because rule, government, requires an assemblage of factual information that no individual can possess. Milton, a century or more before that, had said that the streaming fountain of truth will be turned to a muddy pool of conformity and tradition if freedom of speech is constrained. And we can't afford public knowledge to be just about conformity and tradition when it's the safety of humanity. It's the facts of what is or is not safe for us that is at stake. And at a time, particularly as in a public health crisis, when, as Thomas Hobbes in the mid-17th century put it, we have to avoid the danger of falling into the confusion of a disunited multitude. Now, this might sound like just a defense of having free journalists. And of course it is that, but that's not enough because just as the COVID-19 crisis is very complex, so the journalism, the journalistic institutions we need are complicated too. Here we need to draw on some other theorists, theorists who are much closer to communication science, such as the legal theorist from America, Ed Baker, who wrote 20 years ago that complex democracy requires both segmented media and general media. In other words, it means the general news media that support the search for societal agreement on our common goods and segmented media that speak for particular interests, that let particular voices come through. Or as a French theorist, Pierre Rosenval on pudding, a French political theorist, democracies need discourses for commonality that make our social life legible and visible. We need to see what is going on in our societies and also create a shared, symbolic territory of shared trials, parallel histories. And I think in Britain and many other places, 
Journalism certainly is doing this right now. It is sharing knowledge of how other people are coping with the very same crisis that each of us is Christ cr cr uh, coping with. So those are some theories who I think are useful. And I want to offer you a, a, a model for four basic ways in which media institutions are essential for humanity today for our human development. The first is very familiar, the providing of information resources. For elites, of course, for governments, as we've seen, but also for the general population, for all of us, ever more essential at a time of crisis. But that's not enough, because at the same time, journalists must not just present the facts, official facts, their interpretation of the facts, but witness different perspectives on the facts, recognize the diversity of life. And if they do those first two things, that will sometimes mean that they have to speak truth to power. They must correct governments when they get the facts wrong, when they don't listen to the facts, or when they ignore the suffering of particular parts of a population. And that also means that very often journalists have to speak with civil society to argue for redressing injustice. Those are four levels, I think, which are essential for journalism to contribute to human development today. But the thing I want to stress is that this very simple model of journalism doesn't depend on a theory of democracy. It doesn't depend on any idea of the sovereignty of the people, which was the classic theory of democracy and journalism from Tocqueville in the 19th century. Instead, it depends on a broader value, which is the optimizing of human beings' chances as Amartya Sen put it, to fulfill our capabilities to have a wider quality of life. In other words, at the most basic level, in the face of a global health crisis, to fulfill, to maximize our chances of survival, of having any chance of a good life in the future. So I think the COVID-19 crisis forces us to clarify journalism's public rationale even so, though, there are some really special challenges which journalism, along with every other institution, faces today in the COVID-19 crisis. Let's just run through a few of those. There's an overwhelming need for governments to act rationally in response to the actual facts, not fantasy, of the crisis. So journalism must present facts. Journalists must question when governments don't seem to be acting rationally. At the same time, the economic crisis that is the result of public health measures is creating a social crisis, very uneven impacts. And that means that it's essential for journalists to reflect the diversity of experience, to witness what is going on across society. I also said there's a danger that governments and communities will use this health emergency to discriminate against particular groups. And that makes it even more important that journalism is involved in reflecting the diversity of experience and reporting actual injustice as it is happening. In other words, every level in that model of what journalism needs is essential for journalism to fulfill its role in human development today. It's not just a matter of giving the facts, presenting a so-called objective presentation, perhaps one that relies particularly on what the government of the day says. All levels are essential, especially because in a crisis, when the facts are deeply contested, deeply controversial, those facts can easily be mixed with short-term political advantage and political spin, which makes it even more important for journalism to present diverse perspectives that put the facts to the test. Diverse perspectives that reflect different regions, different classes, genders, ethnicities, different professional roles, the views of nurses, not just as businessmen, the views of migrant workers, not just of company owners. And this in turn requires a solidarity, not just in society, we're talking a lot about that today, but between journalists, between national journalists and local media journalists, between mainstream journalists working for large-scale broadcasters and small community media 
who may provide an essential perspective on the diversity of experience in a major national crisis. And then there is a specific challenge of the COVID-19 crisis, which journalists have a special role in facing, a specific justice challenge, which comes because how societies respond to this crisis reflects their underlying political logics. This point was made a month ago, again in El País, by a Spanish writer who said that, tell me how your community constructs its political sovereignty. Tell me, in other words, how it is constructed as a political entity, and I'll tell you what forms your epidemics and your measures to confront them will take. That's a very interesting point because it brings out the danger of new injustices that will emerge in this crisis that simply reproduce with new force the old social and political discriminations. The danger, in other words, of scapegoating particular groups of people ignoring the suffering of others. And to think about this special injustice, I want to introduce just one last theorist before I finish my talk, the political theorist from America, Nancy Fraser who uniquely has written about this political dimension of justice, which is so often forgotten. The dimension of justice which tells us who is included in and who is excluded from the circle of those entitled to justice in the first place. Who do we think about when we think about who is getting a fair deal? Whose suffering do we never think about when we think about justice? Who's hidden in the shadow? And this underlying politics at the deepest level of who is included and excluded from our view when we think about political justice is itself a level of injustice that we have to remember, especially at times of crisis when resources are so scarce, when fear is so high. And journalists, I think, have a special responsibility to be alert to this deep form of injustice and to confront it. Why? because journalists have the special capability to do this. Journalists, after all, have more access to facts than most people in society. They can choose the diversity of voices they represent, and it's really vital that they spot any injustices in terms of who is being heard and who isn't. So let me just sum up. What is happening today right across the world is that the coronavirus is literally shaking society apart. It's shaking apart existing social orders. And in the course of that, there's no doubt that new social orders are being built, whether they're going to be good or whether they're bad. And we will find out before long. We don't know as yet. In this situation, journalism's role, summing up what I've said so far, is to exercise as well as it can its special, unique role as society's institution everywhere for circulating information, representing voices, and confronting injustice. Citizens, populations, humanity as a whole, whether they live in democracies or not, because that is not the question, need something like journalism, something like professional journalists to exercise those roles because without strong journalistic institutions, societies are not only poorer, not only, as Amartya Sen says, less developed, they are less safe. But the question, the unanswered question I have to leave you with is, how do we sustain, how can we build those journalistic institutions today in an age of social media, when, as we know, social media and many other forces are damaging journalism's historic economic models. That's today one of society's great unanswered questions in democracies and elsewhere. And we urgently, I think, need to find the answers to that institutional question. So that's why I'm going to stop. Thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to all your fascinating questions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Nick. Uh, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. I was holding my breath literally for the last 40 minutes, A, because your, your talk was so riveting, and B, uh, 
um, j just marveling at the fact that we have 157 people at the same time, all able to, to talk and turn their cameras on. And yet we had an uninterrupted talk. I mean, I think it's um, a big word of appreciation to everybody who's participating here, who sort of kept the discipline of keeping their cameras off and their, and their mics off. Um, it was a fascinating journey that you took us through, through Nick. And um, as we move to the next um, next part of this of this meeting, uh, which uh, which makes it very different from a webinar, it is going to be interactive. But I will ask that we follow a, a few rules. Uh, this is uh, to the 157 or people who are who are uh, participating here. Uh, please do keep your uh, video camera turned off. Um, at all times, because um, it, it, there is going to be a lot of load uh, on this meeting. There are you know, plenty of us uh, online at the same time. Um, secondly, I would um, divide this interactive uh, uh, phase into two parts. Part one, there have been some of you who have sent in your questions beforehand. You've emailed them to us or sent it to us via Twitter. Um, so I will sort of bring in some of you uh, by name to ask those questions and probably we'll take about six or seven of those questions. And then we will, um, if, if we have time and if Professor uh, Caldry has the time, we will sort of open it up and try to make this as real as possible where you can ask questions. But again, it will be impossible for people to turn on their mics and ask questions. It will be chaos. So I ask that you use the chat box at that time and ask your questions. And Professor Colry will be able to read those questions, and he can choose to answer the questions that he thinks are most relevant. It's going to be impossible to answer 150 questions. So uh, that will be fair, you know, part two of this interactive uh, process. Um, but the first part will be where we bring in a few people who have sort of asked questions. And this brings us to a very fascinating period in human history, I believe, where, um, where the, the coronavirus uh, Nick, has, has affected different countries very, very differently. The experience of Italy could be very different to the experience of India uh, or the UK or, um, or the US. Uh, but the one um, industry that has been unified during this pandemic has been the media. Um, and it's, it's fascinating that globally, the press has been focused on, uh, on COVID-19, and which is why it's amazing that even here, we have people represented from 18 different countries, young students, we have academics, et cetera. It's, it's fabulous. I think it's, it's a very exciting time to be alive as media persons, which brings me to the first question that we have. Um, Mr. Romel Turakia, if you are here, if you could unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and then ask the question to, to Professor Nick Hi, I'm um, Romel, just a friend of the National School of Journalism. Uh, just uh, you know, that, that was an extremely riveting talk, like uh, like Timothy said. But you know, I, I couldn't help but wonder this, right? So this the topic is media's response to COVID nineteen in a way, and and uh, it is true that the virus is in the air, and I mean in the air, uh, obviously with a pun. Every publication, be it newspapers, magazines, news reportage, op eds, whether it's reportage or op eds, anything, everything is COVID filled. Um, but has all other news stopped happening? I don't think so. In the meantime, uh, India has attacked a few base camps in Pakistan. Normally, that would get like the full, like three pages out of the first, uh, you know, out of 10 in the first, the first three pages. It was like th two column inches in the first, on the first page. Uh, the US, the Pentagon has declassified videos on UFOs. None of that has got reported. And this is the quality of reportage in the free press, mind you, the, the press, uh, Professor, you were talking about. Uh, and they're not slave to any regime. Uh, however free they are, they are slave probably to public consumption patterns. And so what, you know, my question is just simple. What needs to fundamentally change here? What structural flaws uh, lead to this type of reportage? Perhaps the answer to that uh, is the answer to your unanswered question that you left us all with. 
Well, that's a very uh, good point, Aroma, a very, very good point. And of course, um, the brief that I had for doing this talk was to think about the relations to COVID-19. So I focused on that. But as you say, that's what everyone's doing. And that's potentially the danger <laughs> that we're not remembering all the other things that continue to go on. I don't think to be honest, think there's a great deal we can do about that in the short term, because in my life uh, and the life of anyone older than me that I know, there's never been a time like this. This is a situation, although the war, the target is a virus, when the world is consumed in a sort of common struggle one way or the other. And I've never known a time when there is only one news topic throughout the 30, 40 pages of The Guardian. This is almost the only topic. Everything is looked at through the lens of COVID-19. And there are worries. That means this is a perfect opportunity to start a war on a small scale, to continue the devastating war in Syria, as you say, to do things on the border in other countries. You're absolutely right there. And somewhere, journalists do need to counter that and to resist that. At the same time, I would say, that this mass crisis is big enough to actually cast light on the structure of societies, their deeper inequalities, which are normally covered up. So one positive thing going on in Britain is that people are actually celebrating what they call here key workers, people who do very ordinary jobs, low-paid jobs, insecure jobs to get packages around the country and so work in supermarkets and so on, hospital porters. And they're being celebrated now, and the media's played a role in that. So to some degree, the obsession with the crisis has actually turned a light on aspects of society that, everyday aspects of society that are normally forgotten. So I would say that in terms of some aspects of social news, the journalists are doing a good job. In relation to some of the geopolitical issues you mentioned, they're obviously not doing such a good job, and that is a real worry. And you're right, there needs to be a correction at some point. But uh, this is one area, normally I'm a critic of media, but here I, I wouldn't be so critical in the short term. But I think you're right, an adjustment needs to come. Well, thanks so much. That is a great perspective. Back to you, Timothy. Um, Nick, uh, fascinating answer. And in India, um, obviously, there are different perspectives. And India, um, and we talked about this a few days ago, uh, India has been gripped by fear. Um, and to the extent that uh, doctors, healthcare workers are being attacked uh, because they fear that somehow, you know, people will contract the virus, hospitals are being um, shut down. Um, and Travelers are being lynched, assuming that somehow the virus would, you know, would just kill them. And it's not helped by headlines in the leading newspapers, which, for example, today, the headline is there's a 21% rate of recovery, um, which, is, um, which is utterly um, wrong. It's just fact. People just don't have uh, the right understanding. Uh, so this brings me to the next question, which is going to be asked by a 17-year-old. Um, so I'd be quite impressed that... Uh, she yeah. would have a question um, at that uh, young age. Uh, Priyanka Giri, if you're in, uh, if you're on in this call, can you just unmute your, your your mic and ask the question, please? Hello, sir. Thank you so much for such an interesting talk. My question Hi. to you is: In your book, Media White Matters, you speak of the importance of media and its role during the era of Nazism and fascism. In the context of COVID. Do you think that media has played a similar role in fanning fear? That's a very good question. Um, and I don't know the details of the situation in India. I'll be honest about that, and I won't want to presume too much by commenting in detail, um, because I know the situation is very complex, uh, complex and difficult. But I did hear early on that after the government introduced the lockdown measures, there were very quickly uh, some media coverage uh, uh, linked to some members of the G BJP or people outside the BJP who were suggesting that Muslims in particular were a danger. There was no medical basis whatsoever for that claim. So when I made the speech that I did talking about witnessing diversity and this fear of the very special injustices that can come when some people are regarded as less 
important, less human, more dangerous, more risky than others. That's exactly when good journalism has to say no. It has to look at the facts. It has to see, is there any rational factual basis for that claim? And even if there might be variations in which populations for medical reasons are more at risk, and as we know, there is evidence um, that, that black people uh, may, for reasons linked to certain vitamins, be more exposed to some of the risks of COVID-19. That, of course, is absolutely no reason to give them less respect, to give them less treatment, and so on. So this is a time when journalists have to be very, very clear-sighted as to what their long-term values are. And going back to the broader question of fear, this is a difficult situation because, and I'm speaking personally here, I'm sure we all feel the same, I have been afraid of what this disease means, not just for me, but particularly for my wife, who's more at risk than me. I have spent evenings genuinely fearful for what this means. But that doesn't mean to say that the journalists can stop there. They can't, I think, not present the facts which are fearful themselves. They are terrifying at certain points. But in presenting the facts, they have to go on challenging interpretations of the facts with more facts. They have to help society go on reflecting about what these genuinely fearful facts should mean for all of us, how it should make us think about the common dangers, which we all share, because as Roma said, this is a danger that is in the air. It's not carried by each of us. It's something passing between us through the basic fact that we're human beings and we share the same air. So we have to come up with common solutions. And that puts a special emphasis, I think, on those two duties of journalists to present the facts, but always do so with a view to the need for diverse perspectives on those facts, which could come particularly from the people who they might politically be happy not to hear from, to exclude in some way from their political horizon. It's desperately important to be inclusive at this point. So your point about fear is absolutely fundamental. When journalists emphasize fear, they are actually increasing or they're decreasing the safety for all of us. And they need to think about that as human beings. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, wonderful answer. Um, you talked about um, the huge impact on the, the loss of advertising revenues to, to news, news organizations um, around the world. Um, so we have an interesting uh, follow-up question to that as it relates to digital media. Uh, in particular, I'm going to ask Matilda Ribeiro to, um, to ask that question. Matilda, um, are you there? Um, I'm going to give it two seconds, otherwise I'm just going to ask her question. Okay, her question is, um, do you see paywalls erected by digital media outlets as hindering the free dissemination of information um, as an essential part of democracy? Well, it's very difficult. Um, my favorite newspaper is the UK Guardian, which is now a global newspaper and never erected a paywall. And it's now making losses continuously, um, relying on the generosity of its, some of its readers. And it's clearly not sustainable in the long run. And yet we desperately need newspapers like the Guardian because of the quality of their investment in journalism. We paid for newspapers for a very long time. The newspapers which are free, the ones that are handed out on buses and trains and so on, are less quality newspapers. So I'm not necessarily against paywalls as such. Um, they just become more difficult in the world where so much information just reaches us for free. So I think we probably, and maybe the COVID-19 crisis is a time to rethink this. We will have to rethink what needs each of us needs to pay to secure the sorts of levels of quality information that a society needs. Um, whether paywalls are the best way to do it, I'm not sure they are because so much does literally reach us for free through the internet, or whether we need to think of other ways of subsidizing news production, which are not dependent on the state, because obviously these institutions have to remain independent of the state. That question of how societies 
rather than states, subsidize quality journalism, the necessary production of information at a time when the advertising subsidy is falling away, that's a deep social question that we really are only just beginning to answer. But I think what's clear in the COVID-19 crisis is that we have to find answers. We just have to find answers for the safety of humanity. And I think paywalls is just the beginning and probably not the best answer here. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Thank you. Um, I think uh, it's just one question. Thank you. Um, we have lots of questions to get through, I'm sure. Um, and a related question, I'm, I'm going to ask um, uh, Jaya Mira to, to articulate it. It's a related question. So um, Mira, if you're there, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Thank you, sir. So Professor Caldry, what do you view to be the immediate challenge media houses are facing while covering a crisis of this sort as they try to ensure both sensitivity and dignity while reporting true um, and well, also striving to alleviate the spread of fear and anxiety? Well, it is very difficult. Um, I think the provision of factual information, the range of factual information is vital. So if I take the example of The Guardian, uh, there's so much news right now, one can only select from a certain set of newspapers. I tend to look at The Guardian most closely, which has had a great range of factual information. It's had the great range of voices of people suffering and so on. It's also represented very well uh, the disputes within the scientific community. There are a lot of British scientists who are, for example, very unhappy with the British government's handling of COVID-19 and unhappy with the way the scientific uh, committee advising the government has been acting. And they've been given the chance through The Guardian to express their opinions and involved in debate. And that's been really uh, useful. Um, so I think in any one story, it may be almost impossible to get the balance right. So one has to look at the whole range of production of a newspaper over time and see whether over time they represent a sufficient range of opinions where facts are disputed, represent the opposite uh, side of the fact, uh, and, and so on. Um, and I think it's particularly important not just to take the government perspective, not because it's helpful just to immediately distrust everything government says because governments are doing an extraordinarily difficult job right now. They need people's attention and they need to be listened to seriously. But at the same time, their facts should be challenged, their claims, their assumptions need to be looked at. And crucially as ever, it's essential to hear from journalists about what is not being talked about. To give you an example, in Britain, the figures on deaths on COVID-19 until very recently, in fact, until today, were only covering who was dying in hospitals. But in the past two or three weeks, we found out that hundreds, thousands of people were dying of COVID-19 in the care homes for elderly people. And these were not being counted by the government because it was inconvenient to count them. Now they're being counted and the figure is dramatically different. That came about through journalistic pressure. So that was a very important uh, campaign for journalists to make. At the same time, they're giving perspectives of what it's like to work in a care home, what it's like to work uh, as a scientist trying to develop a vaccine uh, and so on and so forth. We need more and more perspectives, more and more facts, more and more contesting of the facts. Uh, and this is an an ending process. So in, in a sense, there's no right answer to your question. There never is a perfect balance. Uh, there's no right, one way of dealing with the challenge, but that's the struggle that has to go on. And of course, as we've been saying, journalists need the resources to find out the facts, to go behind the government statement or the corporate corporation statement. They need resources to do that desperately. Um, that uh, brings us uh, very nicely onto the next question by K.S. Arartik. Um, and uh, after you answer this question, there's a special guest uh, who would ask a question who you may know, uh, Professor oh. Vinod um, oh. from the University of Hyderabad. So uh, after you answer this question, uh, Vinod, you could, um, you could um, 
um, you know, get into um, this group and, and ask a question, your, your own questions. So this question is, um, with several allegations of real case count uh, suppressions by, by several governments, you mentioned the UK um, and obviously China comes to mind and um, different countries around the world. Where does the media draw its reliability in terms of factual uh, data to report accurately, uh, especially since, you know, sort of uh, public health numbers are in most countries in the world controlled by, uh, by, by governments? That's a very good question. Um, I'm not an expert about the production of these sorts of facts, of course. Maybe you know more about it than me. Um, I think that the only answer we can reasonably give as a society, because let's face it, we don't expect journalists to be health uh, specialists or experts. We may have a health correspondent who knows more about health data than the average journalist. But the sort of questions that need to be asked may be a relatively simple. Um, we can all imagine the types of places where people die. They can die in a family home, a hospital, a care home, and so on. Are they all being counted? Um, um, we can also look at the rise in statistics. So, for example, uh, increasingly in Britain, another difference is the government was just giving us deaths per day, but there was no reference point for those to assess those figures. It was only when it started to come out much more slowly from the Office of National Statistics that uh, there was a big difference between the number of deaths this uh, winter and the deaths in previous winters, that it became absolutely clear there was a very major crisis here because people die in every winter. And that came from a different source, from the National uh, Office of National Statistics. So journalists, by seeking out alternative sources, uh, by not just accepting one source, can already do a lot to challenge the government, which would prefer to rely on one source. And then, of course, right now, there is a comparison going on between 20, 30, 40 countries around the world. And journalists are able to make those comparisons if they have the resources to do so. So I think what this is bringing out, and this is where you're getting to, I think, is that this is absolutely a time when we realize the importance of investment in journalism. If the only role a journalist thinks they have is just to repeat the government press release, they're not being a journalist. They're not doing what humanity needs at this time where facts need to be tested. But to challenge the government press release, they need resources. They need time to investigate behind that. They also need the confidence that comes from an institution to challenge what government is saying. And so this underlines the vital importance of resources, journalistic time, the authority of journalists to challenge, to take risks, and so on. All of this drives us back to the fundamental question of why we need institutions for circulation of public information. In other words, why we need journalistic institutions, newspapers and the like, rather than individuals working on their own who will rarely have that authority. Thank you. Uh, Professor Vinod Pavarala. Hi, Nick. Uh, it's uh, so nice to have you in India, even if uh, virtually. It was really disappointing uh, not to have you and uh, Ulysses visit us. Uh, I'm really thankful to Timothy for uh, taking the initiative to organize this. And I really hope we'll get you back to India sometime soon physically. Uh, yeah. But I have uh, a couple of uh, questions, uh, Nick, in response yeah. to this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, one is uh, a little more uh, sociological. I mean, if you look at uh, the way in which uh, the virus has really pushed us into self-isolation, into a fear psychosis, uh, terms like social distancing, uh, that we are using so casually. I'm just wondering whether this is uh, the beginning of uh, some kind of decline of social solidarity uh, within civil society, as each one in fear is fending for oneself. You know, do we lose the ability to work together 
in social solidarity to address some of the mounting problems that we are all facing together. Uh, the second question is much more to do with uh, journalism and journalists. Uh, in India, at least, uh, after the crisis, a number of journalists have lost their jobs. Mm. Uh, a number of uh, uh, organizations in the legacy media, but also uh, on uh, uh, web portals are uh, firing journalists, laying them off. I, I'm, I'm just wondering whether this uh, precarity uh, of uh, you know, job security will finally lead some of our journalists to align themselves much more with the cause of the working classes, the migrant workers. Uh, I mean, journalists in India are often accused of being obsessed with celebrities, of being elite-centered. You know, I'm wondering whether their own precarity would now shift focus and make them align to more uh, working class uh, uh, interests. Yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. Well, thank you, Vinod, for those two fascinating questions and, and, and lovely to, I think, to, to, to hear you, at least, if not to see you. And um, thanks for all you did to try and get me to mm. India. And I'm sure we will do it again. We got very close this time, very, very close. I'm sure it will happen. But great to hear from you. Um, on your first question, ah, there, I see, I thought I saw you before. <laughs> now I see you. Good. Good to see you. Um, the first question is a very deep one, and of course I don't have a definitive answer. What will happen to social society, society, sociality? I think uh, the first thing I'd say, um, and this goes back to the very first question from Romo, why is journalism so obsessed with the coronavirus? And I think one reason is that what is being shaken is the whole social order. It is the whole set of millions of interconnections that hold everything together and give us the feeling we live in a society at all. That is what is at stake right now. Uh, that's going to be re-engineered in some way, so we really have to be careful how it's re-engineered because it could be extremely dangerous if we get the wrong solutions, and there is obviously a real danger of that. So that fear is going on, and you're asking, well, what will people's response be? Um, and I, there have been some pieces recently, some good ones by journalists saying, will we, will the real danger not be uh, the lockdown restrictions, the laws, but our own psychological sense of fear that we, we don't want to go on a plane anymore. We don't want to go into a crowded uh, mosque or a church or a bar or something. And I was thinking about that this morning. And it's possible. And I think depending on whether we or someone very close to us has died or had the virus will make a big difference. But so far, my sense uh, from meeting the people I do in the small village where I live outside Oxford is that people are valuing more their chances when they do meet. They feel a joy of meeting people, of seeing, of just waving and so on. This means more than it normally does and they're having more time to think about how life is based on this. So I think it's ambiguous. And of course, wartime is ambiguous. People's sense of camaraderie in wartime is often massively intensified, even as they do brutal things to each other and are very harsh to each other. So I think I'd probably say it's very ambiguous. But of course, it does mean that those possibilities of solidarity have to be highlighted they have to be brought out by media. And in Britain, there's been some success in bringing out those forms of solidarity, particularly where they've been missing in the past. People just take for granted their packages turn up on time. They don't care. They shout down the phone. Now they know it's a human being who depends on the money from that, and they can see they're taking a risk of physically going out into the world. They understand that differently. I think people probably won't forget that completely. Whether that, at the same time, when the crisis ends, people will be desperate to refer to normality 
They'll be terrified of what, what's happening economically to themselves, their children. So the competition will become even more brutal. So I think it's a very unstable cocktail of things at the moment. And again, it's going to take leadership. It's going to take civil society organizations to see who takes the opportunities, who builds on this or not. So I think it's unstable, radically unstable, and it's very much going to depend on which forces try to take the lead of this. There's no right answer at the moment. There's a lot of potential for bad and good, I think. Um, your second question about journalism, and it's very depressing to hear of the loss of jobs. I haven't heard the same stories in Britain except in relation to local newspapers, which have lost all their advertising income, so simply cannot survive right now. They have no economic basis whatsoever. But at the national level, I haven't heard this, um, and demand for news is up. Um, will it lead, though, those journalists to become more political? Um, it could do, but again, I think only if new forms of civil society organization emerge. That's what's missing. That's why I deliberately mentioned in my talk community media. I didn't have time to talk in detail about community media, but you will obviously have noticed that. And that was deliberate because community media are media that, that seek the truth, that still seek the truth, but coming out of a particular position in society, a particular set of resources and exclusions, and want to tell the truth from there so that our picture of reality becomes more complex. Now, as people are cut off from each other, they're forced to stay in their own village or their suburb of a town, everyone is now aware that there is a possibility there are realities that are really massively different from each other. We genuinely don't know what it's like to be someone poorer than us, maybe richer than us, or in a different part of the country where the resource issues are different. We genuinely don't know unless those people have a chance to tell us. And we no longer assume it's just like uh, it is for me, because we know there's no reason to believe that, because we also know no one knows what it's like for us. So I think that is an opportunity for community media right now to say this is how it is in this part of India or this part of Britain or Sweden, and this is why it's a problem here in this way. So there is an opportunity for community media now because we desperately all want to hear those new perspectives. Um, that means money, of course, but of course, one of the good things, the, the good side of the bad side of the undermining of journalism is that it's quite easy to set up a website quickly if there are people who want to follow it. So maybe this is a time, and this is back to Ashish, who introduced the whole talk, to rethink the rationale of community media right now, the, the implicit subsidy that's there socially in civil society, um, to encourage community media to come out and to speak for these different experiences and to try and link up with the national media. This could be an opportunity for those journalists who've lost their jobs, as you say, to work in, maybe. Um, times of crisis are times, of course, when we need new journalism, as they have been for the past two, three, four centuries. So I think you're right to look ahead there and see this as an opportunity, but it has to be taken. And that requires institutional resources. It requires clear-sighted vision for what has to be done right now, if anything is to be done. So thank you for asking that. It's a great point. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Nick. And thank you, uh, Vinod, for that question. Uh, we, uh, your books in the past, uh, you have talked about data colonialism. And so we have a question on that by um, Anuj Raipe. Thank you, sir. Hi. Uh, Professor, you touched on the concept of data colonialism in your talk before, and you've also said that it isn't a metaphor, but it is soon becoming a reality. In that case, how does our, you know, as millennials or the generation Z, people which is most indulgent into the handling, restrict or resist the ill effects of data colonialism? What can we do to resist the ill effects of the thing? Uh, um, thank I think you, the audio Anu. was quite bad. Did you hear? get the question? I heard it. Thank you, Anu, for your question. I couldn't hear every word you said, but I think I, I basically got you saying that um, uh, 
Is data colonialism literally becoming a reality now because of the challenge of this new crisis? And you may have seen a piece that uh, Ulysses Mejias and I published in Al Jazeera English yesterday he's arguing something like that. Um, so for those listening in, uh, data colonialism is the idea that the big story of what's happening with data today, the fact that data is being gathered from us all the time through our phones when we're online and so on, is not just about the supercharging of a new capitalism, a surveillance capitalism, as Shoshana Zuboff calls it, but that there's something even bigger going on, which is a new stage of human history. Uh, as dramatic potentially as the opening of the colonial era originally in 1500, when suddenly the whole world's resources became open for seizure by countries in the in the West, Spain, Portugal, Britain, Holland, particularly land then and natural resources and, of course, the bodies to work the land. And we argue, Ulysses and I, that this new stage of history that data extraction is making possible is making the whole of human life itself, the stream of human experience, the new open resource for capitalism to exploit. Through this colonial land grab, which says that's all for us, that is for corporations, that we comply with when we agree to the terms and conditions of every app and platform that we join. So this is a long danger. Um, it's a long-term process that we believe, or we did until recently, will take 10, 20 years to fully unfold. But we argued just this week that the COVID-19 crisis, because of the enormous risks to public health coming from the degree to which all of us are moving around space, is creating a tremendous opportunity for those organizations that do want to grab more data, that do want to know where we are at all times, whether or not there's a health crisis or not. This is a tremendous opportunity for them to shore up uh, their legitimacy uh, with customers, their authority with governments, and their legal rights to grab that data. And some are doing it more carefully than others. The Apple and Google app proposed tries to be very careful about privacy and not giving the data over to government. As we know, I've seen recently that in India, in some states like Karnataka, uh, the local states are being much less careful in gathering data. And the same is true in Russia, Israel, um, South Korea, and so on. So there are real dangers. And it's not easy to know exactly how we resist something this big. Um, what we say, I suppose, is there are two things that we have to do. First of all, we have to use our imagination. So in, as in any other time in history when big change is coming, there's one fundamental tool which must always be in play, which is our capacity as human beings to imagine a different future, not to accept the future which seems to be the only one offered to us because it's the only one that certain powerful parties want us to have. We always retain the power to imagine a different future where something different happens because we have challenged the lines of change. So our imagination is the most powerful weapon that all of us have. But of course, it's no good just to imagine things on our own, sitting in our room on our own. Even if perhaps we write a blog, we have to work together. So the second key resource that we've already been talking about is solidarity. We have to help each other imagine the world differently. We help to help each other take steps to become res less reliant on certain apps, certain platforms, and so on and so forth. So the practical answer in relation to the proposals of various governments in Britain and elsewhere, and clearly in India too, to say you must have this app on your phone, you must allow your movements to be tracked and so on, so that we can all be safe, is to say we need to know is this app going to be effective because if it's not going to be effective, why are we doing it? We need to know that it will be safe for our individual privacy and that information cannot be stored elsewhere except on our phones. If not, we need to know why that is being done. And thirdly, we need to know why, what will happen after the health crisis is over. Why will the, uh, these apps last any longer than is necessary for public health? Those are the essential questions that have to be asked, and all of us should be asking them together. And this is happening in a number of countries. And I think it's fair to say that if you go back a month ago, it seemed 
automatic that these apps will be introduced almost everywhere. Now there's more and more doubt. And pre even President Trump has said that there were constitutional worries about some of these apps, which is something he doesn't normally says, say. So we have to stick together. We have to use our imaginations. And we, again, must always challenge the uh, messages that are coming from government and counterpose to them other perspectives. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Nick. It's uh, coming to 10 minutes to 8. Um, yes. So I will uh, probably um, ask a couple of more questions and then yes. maybe uh, we uh, we open it up for five or ten minutes depending on uh, the amount of That's time right. you have. Um, right. it's, it's been fascinating I um, so far. Uh, I started off by, by, by telling you that different countries have had a very different experience um, of, 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 of COVID and um, in India in particular, if you look at infectious diseases as a whole, um, India loses every year um, 1.5 million people every year to infectious diseases like, like COVID, tuberculosis, dengue, etc. Um, so when you look at it in context of 1.5 million people dying every year to infectious diseases in, in India, um, as of now, it doesn't appear that COVID poses as great a, a threat to India. It's very different from, from Western Europe or, or America and multiple reasons why it could be. Is it, you know, the weather? Is it um, cross immunity to other uh, coronaviruses? Is it the, the fact that India is a much younger country, our average age mean um, the, the, the average age is 26 years old? Um, and if you look at Italy, et cetera, you know, 30% of their population is above 60, whereas in India, it's, it's um, you know, less than 4%. So you have all of these other uh, factors in play. So in that context, um, the Oxford University has come up with a study which said that India had the strictest um, public policy responses of any country on earth. Now, um, so a, a, a question that quite a few people have asked um, here is, is this being used as an opportunity by governments who have a te tendency to um, to fascism, etc., to sort of uh, exert government power and, and and cause gross human rights violations. Well, from what I've seen, there's some evidence to support that. You know a lot more of the detail than me, so I, I I can't really comment more than you. But I think you raise a really fundamental issue here. Um, which is that it is very striking that th this global crisis has so far been overwhelmingly dominated by the news perspectives of the richer countries, starting with China, Korea, and Japan, uh, Japan originally, moving across to Europe, United States. We've heard very little from African countries, uh, as apart from South Africa, perhaps. Uh, there's some news in the general uh, world news from Latin America and so on. But the particular situation you're raising of countries where there is already a very high death rate from very infectious diseases, and that is something that is a battle year on year, not just once in a lifetime, um, is not coming through in those global news debates at all, to, to my ears. And clearly it should. Uh, that's why we need national uh, journalists. Uh, it's not possible for the world, the, 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 the human need for information to be satisfied by people in some abstract transnational agency who are out of touch with the realities on the ground in particular nations. So you've just given a very powerful case why you need national just general institutions. But the question then is, why were those uh, issues not coming through in India more clearly than they did? I, I remember at the beginning when your government introduced its first measures, I did see some evidence of some academics challenging it very strongly. But I don't follow the Indian uh, press in as much detail to know whether this was picked up by the rest of the press or not. But what did come through immediately was the cost to migrant populations who depend entirely for their earnings on their movement around uh, the country was enormous and there was no backup being provided by the government 
to protect them from the devastating economic loss they were bound to suffer. So this, for me, brings out again this uh, importance of journalists uh, facing every level of the crisis, not just the public health crisis, but the economic crisis, and then the social crisis caused when that economic crisis affects different groups of people in radically different ways. Journalism has to pay attention to all those levels. If it's just paying attention to one level, then it is missing the complexity that it has to pay attention to if humanity is to remain safe as a whole in all its diversity. So I think you raised a very big challenge, and um, that is an area where voices of community media speaking for migrant population, for example, would have had a very fundamental role to play. I don't know whether they were able to play that role in the, the national debate in India, but clearly in an ideal journalistic ecology, they would have done. So I think you've just underlined my point, um, but you've also underlined a point about the continuing asymmetry, the inequality of the global news agenda and how it remains overwhelmingly dominated by the richest countries and their news priorities. So that it's very hard to hear alternative perspectives coming through, even at a time when every country is listening anxiously to every other country to see what works and what is going on. So you raise a really valid point. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, that sort of brings us to the, um, you know, the end of the time we had for uh, this talk. Um, I can't thank you enough on behalf of the NSOJ family for accepting this talk in such short notice uh, and to, to deliver what I think is uh, a seminal lecture and to be so open and answer these questions, none of which you had access to before um, you got on this call. So we are truly grateful to you for your time and we uh, hope uh, to have the honor of hosting you in person uh, in India soon. We don't know how soon. Um, and uh, what I will ask is um, if, uh, if people for a second can just turn on their cameras, we're going to try to get a group picture with all, you know, whoever is here right now. We have an app which allows us to capture everybody on screen. Um, can so, I stop sharing my, uh, my slides at this point? Yes, you can, yeah, you can stop sharing your slides, yeah. And uh, there are a, a ton of uh, questions that are coming uh, yes. on, on, on Twitter and, uh, and here as well. So let's take a quick group picture. And then if you want to take uh, uh, five or ten minutes to answer some of those questions, you could. Uh, but let me also assure everybody listening to this that Nick is very active on Twitter. And so uh, the questions that are coming to you are hashtag NSOJ talks. And so I'm sure Nick will, you know, come back to you with, with an <laughs> if, if, if to the extent he has the time. Um, so if you can all just turn on your uh, cameras for uh, a couple of, um, you know, 10 seconds, we'll just take a quick group photograph and we'll email that to all the participants here. Um, so if you can do that now, that will be, um, that would be great. Okay. Great. Okay, so if you want to turn on your cameras, you can quickly do that and we'll get a quick picture before the system uh, crashes. So let's do that very quickly. Yeah, can you all tell you? I can see lots of uh, videos coming up now. Um, let me see. Let me take that. Um, okay, I'm just going to give it another couple of seconds. We've got almost everybody's video up. Fantastic. Okay, uh, great. You can you can turn turn your videos off. Um, I think it's going to uh, overload the system. So thank you very much, uh, Nick. Do you want to take um, five minutes to answer some of the questions that you see on the chat box on the top right? I need to let me have a quick look because I've been so busy answering the questions in real time that I haven't had time to um, even see. Let me have a quick look to see what we have here. Um, I think a lot of the questions uh, you may have covered. So if there's something you, we've missed, you can sort of address those. Just, I, I really do want, because there may be some essential things here that are... Uh, right. That's an interesting one. Um, Uh, 
Um, I think Yes, okay. Um, a very interesting point made. Uh, I'm just trying to see, remind myself who uh, asked it. Um, but, oh, that was Matilda, actually, again. But it was a different, uh, not the question that she asked earlier. Um, she asked, do I think that in a situation like the pandemic, human rights such as the right to freedom of speech may be curtailed by governments? Well, clearly that's a danger. But I think that will be very, very problematic. Um, if we compare it with a war situation, um, a traditional war against an external enemy who's literally trying to enter uh, the country uh, and literally destroy uh, uh, services directly, who has an evil intent and is a human attacker, that's a very different situation. and It's often thought in that situation, some control over freedom of speech is essential um, to stop rumor of various sorts developing and so on. But as we've learned from many of the questions asked today, um, it's essential to have different perspectives on what is going on. It's simply not possible for government to understand what's going on unless people are free to speak. So I would hold to Amartya Sen's view that it's especially important to have freedom of speech and governments absolutely must not curtail freedom of speech in a situation like this. So in this sense, it's not like some of the, um, the more typical types of war situation uh, that we look at. Um, uh, Chetan Craster asked about the internet failing to deliver its uh, promise. Um, or was Matilda, were you trying to come back in there? Hello, Matilda? Yes. Yes, I'm want, here. Uh, do you want yes, to say I something? Want to thank you for your answers and for this interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, do you want to say anything more on that point about freedom of speech, or did no, I answer? Uh, your answer was sufficient. Thank um, you very much. All right. Chetan raised a very interesting point just a minute later about whether the internet has failed to deliver on the promise for providing a platform for independent journalists um, because news is still dominated by large corporations. Um, I think that's absolutely right. Um, on the one hand, I'm very grateful for a large corporation like The Guardian providing the range, the massive range of news coverage it's doing today. I don't know whether you feel the same about any newspaper outlets in India right now. Um, I hope you do. I just don't know. It'd be interesting to hear. But similarly, I'm grateful to the New York Times and so on and so forth. Institutions at a situation like this are essential. And I've never agreed with people like Jeff Jarvis from New York, who thought that journalistic institutions can just disappear and journalism can just be a matter of individual uh, pioneers out on the frontier gathering information. That's not sufficient to deal with uh, societal problems as complex as these. But at the same time, Chet, and I think you're right, the diversity is also crucial. So as I mentioned in the conversation with uh, uh, Vinod earlier on, Professor Parawella, it's essential that community media voices are heard. And I don't know at the moment whether mainstream newspapers are doing anything to help them be heard. So there is an issue about the subsidies needed there. Um, as mainstream news organizations probably are facing an advertising crisis because corporations don't have the money to invest in advertising, this may not be a realistic time to ask them to put money aside to invest in community media. But then it becomes a matter of what governments need to do. Governments need to encourage freedom of speech, encourage diversity of speech. They're probably not doing this right now, but they should be called upon to do that. So I think you raised a really important point about um, diversity. Um, uh, Abdul raised a point about WikiLeaks and the arrest of Julian Assange, which is a long-term issue about whistleblowing but again raises this fundamental question about whether the future of humanity is served by sharing more information, by revealing fundamental truths or not. And I think I'm with you that in the end, Julian Assange, whatever his methods, did a fundamental service um, in revealing a lot of crucial information about what governments were doing. Um, and that's particularly important to know what governments are doing in this current crisis. So 
in a sense, it plays out in the favor of someone like Assange, although not to one degree, because Assange was quite happy to bring down governments with his revelations. This is possibly not the best time to be bringing down governments because we need governments to remain in place to handle the responsibilities we need them to, to handle. Um, I'm trying to see, someone has asked, could I send the presentation? That's Ilira uh, Tudovayeva from Russia. I will be very happy to share my slides via uh, Timothy and Venusia at the NSOJ. So I'll send it to them and I'm sure there's a way to make the slides available um, through the NSOJ website. I'd be very happy to do that in a few minutes. Great. Uh, Nick, there's one question uh, on Twitter that, you know, uh, oh. we never touched upon. And this yeah. comes from uh, Panya Mota. I don't know if she's on the call right now. Uh, but she says, does political in the, the political leanings of news outlets influence wow. the reporting of COVID-19? And what effect has that had on, on public opinion? I'm, I'm sure you have plenty of uh, experience of that in your own country. So, I have. Um, I haven't done any systematic study, Panya, to be honest. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, I think at the times of crisis, unless you decide you're going to study it, you tend to, in a panic, just read the newspapers you're most familiar with. So I'm not absolutely sure. I know what's happening in Britain right now from what I gather from the headlines is that even the conservative newspapers in Britain are often very critical of the conservative government right now and the, and the failures of the British government to deal with the crisis. So I think... Um, there's more evidence of a diversity of opinion than there would be, for example, in a typical war where there's an external enemy, whereas we all know there's very little uh, dissent and very few alternative opinions. So um, in Britain, I would say things are working relatively okay, but it's too early to be certain. How do you think things are happening in India, if that is where you're from, Panya? What do you think? Um, yeah, you're First on. Of all, thank you for answering the question. Um, currently, um, I don't think I am uh, well the right person to answer this question. So, but yes, there are news channels that are uh, politically inclined to certain, you know, political parties. So maybe they might have. Um, they might have an inclination to provide a certain kind of content to the public and, you know, influence the public in a certain way. So I was just wondering if, you know, you might have some opinion on um, if whether the reporting, does it, does it affect the reporting of the yeah. crisis as well? Thank you, Panya. Uh, Nick, just to, to just substantiate a little, just to give you yeah. some sort of detail. Um, media in India, particularly regional media in the various states, each you know dominant, each of the dominant political parties has their own news channel, and so yeah. you have competing narratives that you know uh, that the party faithful sort of tune into. Um, at the national level, why you don't have that sort level of control, but I think reliance on government advertisements for revenues and that's a huge chunk of revenues for for media houses that sort of you know um, creates an indirect um, reliance on 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 government um, advertisement for their sustainability and revenues that's that is where we do have you know uh, media houses um, strongly yes. taking the government line yeah well, this obviously underlines the crucial, the old argument for diversity of funding. It's absolutely essential. Um, uh, obviously, reliance on state funding is, uh, in the end, uh, uh, undermines the diversity that's essential to the journalistic environment. Um, and um, I think it's a little ambiguous in relation to the political situation now because every um, newspaper perhaps has to calculate um how vulnerable the government is, the national government, to bad news. Um, and I think that's what's going on in Britain, that uh, the, even the conservative newspapers, which naturally want to support the government and are very ruthless in doing so normally, know 
that their readers are affected deeply by this crisis and will not accept direct lies where everyone knows things are lies. They will insist on some challenge to the government if the government is failing in various ways. So journalists and editors have to calculate their long-term political advantage. Um, and I think that creates some instability, but probably not enough, perhaps in a country like India, where the ruling party is in such a powerful position to fundamentally challenge the government's power. So that's where alternative media is needed, alternative viewpoints and ways of circulating alternative perspectives. Every country is differently placed. And I think it's a very valid question, um, you know, that's been raised there to think about. Uh, and maybe someone should be doing some sort of comparative study, but I'm afraid I, I don't have the energy myself to, to do that <laughs> right now. Thank you, Nick. But I, I think you've demonstrated tremendous energy uh, over the last couple of hours uh, to uh, have this, this opportunity. And um, I, I think we can bring this to a close. Um, I will send you the list of all participants. I think some people have joined in here, some have followed the live uh, audio stream on YouTube. We also stream the entire uh, video interaction live on Facebook. Um, and we will have a full edited uh, version out on, on our YouTube channel. So uh, for those of you who are interested in, um, in, in you know, engaging with us, please do follow our, our, our channels. Um, but I would, uh, and I will send you a full list of all participants uh, from, so we had yeah. uh, about 323 registrations wow, wonderful. Talk wonderful. from uh, all around the world. Um, on behalf of NSOJ, uh, on behalf of everybody, and particularly Professor um, um, Vinod uh, Pavlana and, um, and Ashish, who sort of made the, the introduction to be able to uh, make this possible. Big thank you to all of you. Um, and I would uh, like to uh, acknowledge the work of uh, Vinusha Kannan, who is a faculty member who put all of this together with a group of um, uh, 11 students who you met the other day virtually, who have worked really tirelessly. Uh, incredible that over two hours we haven't had any fatal technical issues, but they've been working nonstop to you know mute mics and, and get people to um, you know have the cameras off on, etc. So big thank you to everybody. Thank you, Nick. And we look forward to continuing um, interactions with you over the, the days and weeks, months and years to come. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Timothy. It's been a great honor to do this. And in spite of the difficulties we're all facing, we have to be creative. And I genuinely believe that we are starting to create opportunities for new types of dialogue using these technological forms uh, which will be strong for the future. So let's hold on to this, what we're doing, and I'd be delighted to do this again. And thank you to um, Venusha and all the students who are involved for making it possible. I'm really grateful, and I look forward to doing it again and also to meeting as many of you as possible in person in India before too long. Thank you. Thank you. It's a particular honor because I'm an alumnus of the London School of, Economic, of Economics, uh, so it's a, an honor to have you here with us. Uh, God bless you. Have a great day, Nick. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.